Hey, everyone, and welcome to Livingston First Church. We're so glad you're joining us today. We really hope you're ready to hear a great message from the Word of God. So prepare your hearts, prepare your ears, and get ready to receive a blessing from the Lord. Be blessed. During that last part, and the phrase that comes to mind is, is anything too hard for God? No. Nothing. I just feel that so strong right now. So let's just pray and uh, invite the Lord to speak with this and with that word. So we thank you, Lord. Nothing is too hard for you, no matter what we're up against. Nothing, nothing, thank you, is too hard for you. And we also pray that this word, Lord, that we would be so receptive, we would hear you, we would be led by you, and our, our ears would just be open, God, sensitive to you, and that uh, you would mature us through this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, I want to share a little bit about us. You might know my wife, Michelle. We got Zeke and Hattie. Uh, so Zeke is the one. He's four years old. Um, I'm going to share a quick story about him. So we're having a potluck soon. When is that? Next week. So, okay, the last potluck here. Um, Zeke wasn't so sure. Okay, <laughs> he's four. He wasn't sure if he liked the church. That's, that's where he was at. So don't take that personal. And we go to the potluck, and we're getting in the car, and uh, he's like, they have sweet tea. I love this church. <laughs> so that's, that's my son. It just takes sweet tea, and he'll love you. Uh, it doesn't take much, um, but that's a little small picture of, uh, of my son. All right, so uh, let's open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. That's where we're going to start. Um, yeah, so we're from Alaska. I think most everybody knows that. Uh, I've lived there on and off for 10 years. My wife grew up there. Uh, she's not like a native. People have asked that, are you native from Alaska? No, uh, but she grew up there. So she can tell you all kinds of stories and things about Alaska. Um, we had a good time at Shiloh. We just talked for a long time about Alaska and cruises and stuff. So if you have questions, we can do that now quickly up front. <laughs> it was fun. Honestly, I had a blast. It's just super unique. So I, I, I get thankful for stuff like that. Like that we don't have to be, you know, all rules and rigid and stuff. We can just have a good time together and get into the Word. So you're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. It's going to start around, well, I'm not going to tell you that. I want to ask a question first. Hebrews, uh, anybody know the situation uh, that they were in at this point when this letter is written to them. And I want, if you can, a little feedback. You can cheat. You can look at your Bible. That's okay. But anybody know things about their current situation? And I'll give you hints. Things like, uh, were they mature? Did they have strong faith? Did they know much about Christ? Did they know much about Christ? Like a lot? Not really. Were they very mature? Not really. In fact, he says they're, they're kind of like babies. They're not doing well. That's the current situation they're in. They're not doing well. Um, so go to verse 32, because this is going to describe the former days. So really, this is the early days of the Hebrews. Listen to this carefully. Uh, remember the early days, verse 32, when after being enlightened, you endured great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated. So they were persecuted, and also they helped those who were being persecuted. So from this short little bit, they were doing good. And that last verse there of 34 for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you yourselves have a better possession and a lasting one. So they started strong. Um, I think about like uh, that seed that goes on maybe rocky soil or even the other soils, and it comes up real strong, and then it just starts to struggle and not do so well. Maybe that was their case. Either way, they're struggling. Uh, I asked about Christ, what they knew about there. At the beginning... He's having to describe basic things about Christ, even like, uh, no, he wasn't equal to an angel. Actually, he was far above. Uh, man, they must have really been struggling. I'm not going to say they were way off, but they were struggling. In fact, he uses phrases multiple times about falling away. So he's concerned about, oof, they're on a path. Are they going to fall away? He's concerned. 
All right, so let's get a little bit more of what the concern is. Um, verse 30, no, let's go to 26. So move up a little bit. Uh, 26, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the full knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment in the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. So, so there's a real hell, okay? Um, and clearly, he, he's just coming really hard with the truth. And clearly, they're struggling with sin. So let's not throw any punches about it. Let's not, you know, confuse this. They're struggling. They're not in a good spot. He's coming hard at the truth. They're just not doing well. But I do want you to see in this chapter kind of the main point. He finishes with it. So go back down to 35, and he says this, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Isn't that interesting? He started this passage right here with talking about sin and, oh, there's a fiery judgment if you go after that lifestyle of sin. So, I mean, wow, this is an interesting situation, right? That's what I'm kind of wanting to, you to see where they're at right now. Okay, verse 36, for you have need for endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay. But my righteous ones will live by works? No, they'll live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to preserving of the soul. So this is actually the main point of the book, okay? But I love it because the author's like, all right, but I see where you guys are at. Know that if you're going to continue this path, you're actually going to fall away, and it's going to get bad, bad, bad. But I don't see that in your guys' lives. I don't see that happening. Have confidence to draw near God. We're going to get to that in a second. But yeah, I just want to lay this foundation. There's, it's an interesting situation of where they're at. Um, but he's confident of better things. We don't know who the author is. Um, we were talking about it earlier. It could have been Barnabas, could have been Paul. We don't know, so I'll just say the author. All right, so now we're going to go to chapter 3. Here we go. Let's get into how they got to where they are. It just it, ah, it befuddles me. They were, they were doing so strong at first, and now they're, they're questioning things like, it, was he equal with an angel? You know, things like that. So that chapter 1 gets into that. All right, so chapter 3, it's going to be verse 1, but I want to ask questions. And again, I, I welcome responses to this. What are some themes of this book? Key themes, the main points of it. Faith, one of the biggest ones, faith. Okay, there's more. More main stuff in Hebrews. Maturity. What else we got? Yeah, something better. Uh, a better high priest. A better covenant. There is something better. And that's what he's getting at. Um, I had a really good time talking with Pastor John. Their situation, they came from Judaism. I mean, they were intense at it. Come to Christ, they're free, like they're telling everybody, they're getting their property taken away, it doesn't matter, let's keep going strong. Now, they're struggling to go back to that lifestyle. And even sin. I mean, a lifestyle of sin, okay? All right, so chapter 3, here we go. Let's go verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partakers of the heavenly calling. I love that he says things like that because they're at a dangerous point. But he's like, ah, but you're still partakers of the heavenly calling. I'm confident of better things. You see that balance? That's intentional. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, Father, as Moses also was in all of his house. Verse 3, For he who has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all of his house as a servant. For a testimony of those things which were spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a Son. I love that. The Son becomes the high priest that we needed desperately to draw near God, came, did it all. Son over his house. Whose house? We are. If. Oh, I love that. This is another key thing in Hebrews. If. 
we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. See that? Like, that's that balance thing again. If, if we hold fast. And, and more of what that picture looks like, we're going to develop that. Verse 7, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, so important in this book, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they... So hold up right there. Today, when you hear his voice, that's just kind of like while you have a chance, while you have opportunity. And a perfect example, that next verse. Do not harden your heart as when they provoked him. Anybody know what that's a reference to? In the Old Testament, when they provoked him in the wilderness, the Israelites, they're out there, they're testing God, not a good testing. I mean, they were grumbling, complaining, not a good testing God. Not like uh, tithing, test me and you'll see I provide. No, this was a bad kind of testing what they did. Uh, so in, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, verse 9, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. So still, God's mercy and his grace, you know, he was providing for them. He'd give them manna. He'd give them what they needed. Oh, they wanted it to be like this. They wanted it on their terms. You know how we do that. But he's like, no, I've got your provision and I've got the promised land. Stay focused. Stay on the truth. But they got off track. All right. So verse 10, therefore I was angry with this generation. And I said, they always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. I think that's significant that the Lord says that. Because you can know his ways. I feel like some people, or even parts in here, it's almost like, can you even know God's ways? Yes, you can. In fact, he wants you to know his ways. You draw near to God, you get into his word, you will know his ways. But that generation didn't even know God's ways. I find that significant. Uh, verse 11, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Hmm. Yeah, I think about God's wrath, and it also says his anger there. It's almost like we have to qualify it to understand. It's not like how we get angry. I think a close thing of what that looks like is uh, you think of a couple, a married couple, and let's say the wife goes and she's sleeping around. I hope that husband is not okay with that. In fact, that he has a healthy anger. Why are you doing this? It's not okay. That's a little bit of what it's like with God. It's a pure love. His anger is not like our, our anger. He made a covenant with us. And when we go sleeping around in the Old Testament with other idols or just not trusting God, it, 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 you're going to see his wrath. You're going to see his anger. He's not okay with us breaking covenant. He is a good God. He's so good. So that, that's just a little bit of what I'm trying to hit on there with the wrath of God. All right, here we go. Verse 12, 13, and 14. These are very important for this passage. We'll read them and then we'll skip some more. Verse 12. Take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Mm. Uh, that, I think that's very significant. Uh, that's one of those passages where you see unbelieving, like choosing unbelief. It's actually associated with evil. In fact, I believe you're going to be almost like inviting evil into your life when you refuse to trust God, when you, when you choose to doubt. I, I understand struggling and doubting. I, I know. But at a certain point, you're going to choose a way of, nah, I don't trust you, just like they did in the wilderness. And it's going to be inviting junk into your life. Because uh, the reality is, here's what it is. You're going to believe either the truth or not the truth. And that's why. You're going to believe lies or the truth. So evil, unbelieving heart, that falls away from the living God. That's one of those themes in this book. You can fall away, whatever that looks like. I'm not here to discuss like losing your salvation or anything, but you can fall away. Um, let's be aware of that. That's a key theme in this. And they were strong believers. Uh, but he's going to say, have high confidence at the end. Uh, here we go, verse 13. But encourage one another day after day as long as it's called today. Remember what he's saying there? While you have a chance. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Man, I love that. The way he describes it. That's come back a lot in my life because I've seen it in friends' lives. How uh, sin will deceive you. It will trick you. 
it, it's deceitful. Like literally, it, it, you get a little bit and a little bit more, and you just start believing lies. It's just, you're not even seeing things as they are accurately. You're deceived. That's the direction it takes you. But worse is that it hardens your heart. So here comes God speaking, actively speaking, or the Word of God. And what was a pliable, soft heart that heard the Lord, that, was, that had ears to hear Him, now is like hardened steel. And No. That's the direction. That's what happens when you choose more and more that lifestyle of sin. And that's what he's, he's warning them of. Um, I think I wrote something down about that. Yeah, oh man, um, that hardened. It's, it's an obstinate, stubborn hardenedness. Um, and let's finish this up here, verse 14. For if we have become partakers of Christ, and if we hold fast the beginning of the assurance, firm to the end, yeah, so he's just repeating that. Okay, so let's skip now. Chapter 5. Yeah, just go to chapter 5. So we're going to go verse 11. It's going to be through into part of chapter 6. And uh, this passage, again, he's going to talk about falling away. In fact, that's the main point of this passage. I used to kind of view it that way, like this is what it looks like to fall away. There's more happening there than that. Uh, in fact, especially the end of chapter 5, it's so good. So catch that. But there's these key words here. He, he's talking about like um, solid food, milk, eating, tasting. Um, so he's using food and eating as an example of how you respond at a heart and a faith level to God, to his word, to his presence, to his speaking, actively speaking. Okay, that's what he's going to use this analogy for. So let's catch that. Verse 11, concerning him, that's Christ, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So man, he's coming with the hard truth again. Like, imagine, oh, that's such a corrective but good word if you need it. But you've become dull of hearing. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, and you now have need for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, like a baby. Yeesh. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, verse, uh, this is 6 verse 1, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance of dead works and faith for God, of instruction about washings, laying on of hands, and resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. We will do if God permits. For in this case, those who have once been enlightened, and look at this word, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and they have tasted of the good word of God. I, I want to share a quick story about this that I feel like the Lord just put on my heart some things about it. Um, but some, some basic things are, if you don't eat, you die, right? <laughs> so it's the same thing with our bodies, but how much more spiritually? It is more. Uh, man does not live on, every, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? Well, it's true. Um, so there's a picture this Lord, Lord gave me. I, at the same time that I was, this was just my personal study time, and uh, a couple months ago, and I was watching a video about this guy in Alaska. So here's your Alaska story if you're wondering about Alaska. Uh, this guy, he was hunting out in Bush, Alaska, and he got a caribou, okay? Where he's at, it basically feeds that community, a small community, uh, and they don't have a lot of food. So he brings in this caribou, and he's dispersing the meat out to people who needed food. But when I was praying later, the Lord showed me, imagine a guy who comes into that picture, okay? And he tastes some of it. He just kind of tastes it. And he's like, oh man, this is so good. Like, this is really good. This will provide for a lot of people. It tastes good. It's healthy. This is the best way to do it. Let's provide for the community. Around where they're at, they don't have much of anything. So, so he does that, but then that's all he does is he just tastes it, this, this guy. And he walks out. And imagine him coming back, not for weeks or months. And he comes in, he's like, oh, yeah, I want to taste it. 
And that's all he does. And he leaves. And he's not eating of it. He's not getting a substance of it. You know? It's the same way with the Word. It's the same way with the Lord. If all you do is just taste, this is going to happen. You're going to fade. You're gonna, and, and that's what the Lord showed me, that guy. He was wasting away and he didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. Deception, that's what happens. So, you, so the Lord will speak. The Lord, just His Word speaks, you know. That's enough. But he, He'll speak even more than that. But man, when He does, respond. Respond. Uh, don't be like that guy who just tastes a little bit and then he's, he's out. I want to show a quick little bit about, uh, I also fed some, I had two plants and I gave one Coca-Cola. What do you think of the one that I fed junk to it, Coca-Cola? It died. I gave another one water. This was a, an intentional example I did. And it, it grew. I mean, it's the same way. You, you feed on junk, you die. But you don't know it, you're just dying and fading away. Uh, I read a story about a guy who ate candy for a week. At the start of the week, he was never really hungry. Uh, he liked candy. He was mentally stable. You know what happens at the end of the week? Mentally instable. That's his own description. He went from a 10 to, he says, a 3. Mentally instable. Uh, he says he, he got hungrier. He, he never used to be very hungry. I mean, when you eat junk, that's what's going to happen. It's the same way. So when God speaks, when you have his word, respond to it. Um, yeah, our, our bodies fade away. How much more our spirit? Uh, okay. Yeah, so here's what I want to point out. So you've got to have the Word of God, but here's the thing. It's almost like the Word of God is not enough. It is enough. Don't get me wrong. But here's why. Uh, think about the Pharisees. They had the Word. At that time when Jesus shows up, I, people like them, there's more teachers, they knew the word more than anybody. They memorized it. It was a part of their, they had to do that. But the Lord corrected them the most. They were more off track than anybody else. They were the blind leading the blind. Remember the deception thing? Pharisees, the ones who had the word of God. So what did they need? Well, they needed to join the word with faith. They needed to have their hearts of stone become pliable again. Okay. So um, look at uh, Romans 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 30. Go there real quick. I, I like to study the Word. It's, uh, I don't know, just I like to use it a lot if I'm going to share. So 9, verse 30. Yeah, what shall, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. And they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So they didn't have to stumble, but they did. Because they were trying to go at this by works instead of by faith. Instead of just, it's a gift and I stay in that place. It's constantly by faith. That's how I grow. It's constantly by faith. But they tried to go at it as, all right, I can do this now on my own. No. No. So that's kind of like, that right there described a major part of why uh, Jews, especially the, the Pharisees, got off track. So then a, a key point is we must join the Word with faith. Um, to not stand far off, like uh, in the Old Testament. Um, actually, we're about to go to a passage right now. Uh, let's just go there. Yeah, go to Exodus 20, verse 20. Exodus 20.20. I love this story. It's a, it's a picture about the fear of God um, versus something else. Uh, go to verse 18. Chapter 20, verse 18. 
All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet. Man, I love that. Like, there's heavenly trumpets going on. God's, God's showing up on the scene. That's what's happening right here. The mountain's about to fall apart. Uh, trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And then they said to Moses, Speak to a, yeah, speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but let not God speak to us or we'll die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that fear of him may remain in you, so that you may not sin. And listen to this. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. You know, all along, God didn't want it like this, what they did. He didn't want that. He wanted them to come close, just like Moses. He wanted that to be possible. And we're going to see in Hebrews, that's what he did. He made access. He made it open. We can come in. But man, it's so heartbreaking because think about the fear of God. They had fear, but it was more of a to guard my own life. Um, it was, uh, they were afraid. I might die. No, have such a fear of God that, that even your own life, I trust you, God, more. I trust you more. Because the fear of God, it's literally, it's to revere Him and honor Him above everything else. Reverence. A high reverence. Uh, they used that term in, in that time because there were things they feared. Great things they feared. And so to fear God, it was like, oh, you see Him as the highest. You see Him as the holiest one. Yes, I do. I fear him above everything else. I honor him. And that's what he was calling him to. He actually, he li- I love it. He literally says, don't be afraid, but fear God. You can do this. So, all right. Go back to Hebrews. We're going to finish that up. And go to chapter 6. So when I think about the, the Israelites at that time when God shows up, It's such a key uh, situation for what's going on in Hebrews. Literally, draw near. Oh, if you take anything away from this, just draw near God. Uh, When He speaks, please draw near. You will never regret that. What you will regret is when you back off. That's what you'll regret. I know that from many of my own experiences. So draw near. Actually, faith does that. Faith literally says, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have to know. But I trust you, God. Um, so, so <laughs> just like that picture I saw, don't just taste, don't just nibble at that meat, right? Actually eat of it. Actually draw near. Trust Him. Faith. Faith does that. Okay. So we're in chapter 6 now. Um, let's read verse 9 really quick. Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking this way. Back to that tension thing, remember? Uh, Though we're speaking harshly, though we're concerned about uh, falling away, ah, but we're confident that the Lord is going to do something. We're confident that you you can still live by faith just like you started. You can finish strong, even stronger. Okay, so skip a little bit more. Let's go to 19 and 20, uh, 6, 19 and 20. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope that is both sure and steadfast, one that enters within the veil where Christ has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I love that it's according to the order of Melchizedek. I took one class in college that was uh, for ancient languages, Hebrew, and that's like one of the few words that I remember. Um, Melk, king, and then Zedek, that's righteousness. King of righteousness. So he does all the hard work for us to be able to come near God, puts his righteousness in us. King of righteousness rules with the scepter of righteousness. And he says, come, it's on you. It's in you. All you do is believe. That's your part. Simple. But stay there. You know, stay in faith. It's so easy to get busy. Here comes doubt and discouragement. Oh, yeah, I'll take some of that. No, don't. Stay right there. It's simple. It's faith. All right, and I love this uh, verse 20 where it talks about he went in as a forerunner. Oh, man. I'm going to say this really quickly, though. Um, 
I love how he goes into the Holy of Holies. So in the Old Testament, they went in there, and that was really a copy here on earth. The real one was in heaven. Christ did that. He went in there with his own blood. Wow. But in the, in, the, in the copy, in the Old Testament, so high priest, there's this tradition, we don't know if it's true because it's not in scripture, but they said that some of them wanted to put a rope around their leg when they went in. And it was because they knew they could die if they didn't do their part correctly. If they didn't do the procedure and everything, you know, deal with their own sin, there was an offering for that, all that stuff. They could drop dead and die. It's the holy of holies. Don't mess around with this. But see, Jesus went in and he did this for us. But that word forerunner, so I looked that up, verse 20, where it says that. So that's a runner or a scout. One who comes in advance where the rest are to follow. I mean, how cool is that? So he goes in the Holy of Holies as a forerunner. He wants us to draw near. He wants us to go in. I mean, that's such good news. Like, he did all the hard work for us. He didn't just establish relationship. No, no, no. He's like, come really close. Really close. Where it used to be you could die. Now, I've made a way. You will not die. You just stay in faith. You just stay with me. Stay in communion. And come close. Real close. I love that. So, he's a forerunner for us. And now we're going to finish this out. Uh, go to, back to chapter 10, where we started. Chapter 10. So, we're going to read starting at 19. And I love how um, the verses before that, he literally summarizes the whole New Testament, what happened, the verses right before. So I'm just going to read those real quick, which is 16. This is the covenant I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Isn't that good news? Good news. So that's that's actually a summary of the New Covenant, the New Testament. Uh, Here we go. But this is the passage I want us to really kind of focus on, which is basically confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies. Confidence to have faith. Um, I meant to, to point out earlier, I want to say it really quick, that You know, when you hear God's voice, respond toward him, not away. Sometimes we have this hesitancy, like they did in the Old Testament, to back off. I'm not sure about you, God. You're kind of dangerous. Or I don't know if I can believe in you. I don't know if you're real. All those things. But man, when you have the word of God, respond closer to him. Draw near. But I wanted to point out this. Why? I feel like people would ask that. Why? Oh, because he's good. That's why. He's so good. He's so good. I can tell a lot of stories. I'm going to finish with one at the end. Um, But he's worth it. He's so good. That's why. That's why we worship him. He is worth. He's literally the only thing worthy of worship. So let's read this last passage right here. uh, Starting in 19. 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have a confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. How cool is that? Like they had a literal huge veil in the, uh, in the, the temple. Now he's like that covering for us. His own flesh. And we enter in with his righteousness on us. I mean, that's so good. That is his body. Uh, go to 20, 21. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with a pure water. Man, that's so good. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. I love it, man. That that should encourage faith. That should cause you to like, whoa, I was scared. I wasn't sure about God. All these things. But look, he made it easy. He likes that I draw near. He wants me to have confidence in him. He wants me to live by faith. He's good. And that's that's really the main point. Um, Enter into the most holy place. And do it often. How do you do that? Just 
for me, I get alone with God. I read the word. I worship. Um, but the main point here is faith. So when I draw near to God, when I go into his presence, faith just goes through the roof. I was going to say, uh, just thank you guys for your heart of worship, but really the whole church, because I find it easy to draw near God in that place. Um, I love worshiping with this body because, man, he shows up, and it's just easy to hear his voice. So, so have confidence to enter in. Um, what this makes me think about is what we read already, which was a few verses later, the current situation. They're struggling. But you know what the answer was? You know what the, they needed? To enter in daily. To draw near daily. That was the solution. And that's what he's saying. The whole passage is, is just stay on this path of living by faith. Stay trusting God. There's trials. There's hardships. They're taking your property. I know all that stuff. You're busy. All that. But man, live by faith. You can do this. But more than anything, man, when, when you draw near God, when you come into his presence, that's why I love worshiping together. That's a game changer for me. And that's what I see in this. Uh, Christ made it possible to get really close to him. It's so worth it. Um, so I'm going to share two stories, and then that'll be it. Uh, the first story is kind of a basically what not to do. Uh, there's a guy that I, go, that I know... Uh, we'll call this guy Bob, and uh, recently Bob, uh, I've known him for about 12 years. <sighs> he goes to a friend's church, and I, I saw him only a couple months ago, and uh, I'm changing his name because Bob decided to, uh, to kill himself, and it's, it's, it breaks my heart because uh, I've known this guy. He's a believer. And the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And somehow he did it in that situation. Now, I believe full heartedly, I'm going to see this guy in heaven, and it's going to be awesome. But there was more for this guy's life. Oh, there was more. There was so much more. But we, there's a little bit we know about his situation, that he was hiding some sin. I don't need to tell anything about it. I just know it got pretty dark. And I believe it, it appears he was full of like shame and all that, that he decided to kill himself, okay? And I just, I hate what the enemy does, because that's what that was. I see the darkness he got into, and then what, it, what happened. And, uh, and I believe this, what I'm getting into, this passage, it's the answer. I know this guy had faith, but I know at times he, uh, it just seems like he didn't really draw near to God very much. That's, that's from what I'm gathering of this story. He just didn't come into the presence of God very often. He just kind of stayed at a distance. He had some faith, but he just kind of stayed back. And, and I think about like that guy in the, in the picture the Lord gave me who just ate a little bit. Oh man, the Hebrews, what they needed just to eat of this daily, come into the presence daily. And they would have been not only starting strong, oh, they would have finished so strong. And I believe they, they did because they got the right word they needed. So I believe they did finish strong. But I want to finish with a really good story um, of when you do draw near to God. So going back to like 2007, I was in college, first year of college. I decided to, to just spend extra time seeking God's face and just worshiping God, just time with Jesus, uh, praying and worshiping. And oh my goodness, it was so fun. It was a blast. I'm, I'm so thankful I made that decision. And so while I'm in the middle of that one day, just by myself, uh, I sense the Lord showing up in some way, and I see this picture. And it's my life, and I see different parts. And this one part that was like missing or broken. And it was me and my brother. And we, uh, we did not always get along. And there was definitely some fracture in that relationship. And uh, the Lord spoke. It wasn't audible, but it was as clear as audible. It was incredible. He said, I'm going to heal this. And I was just like so in awe. All I said was, great. <laughs> I wish I would have asked more. And, you know, looking back now, I had like, I felt like I had all of God's attention, you know. Uh, it was so clear and incredible. And so I just went away with such a joy and confidence. 
And I wake up the next day with an email waiting for me from my brother, of all people. And in that email, ah, man, it was so good. He said, Josh, I know we went through some hard times, especially in high school, but I want you to know I care for you. He never said that before. <laughs> Already off the bat. He said, uh, and I want you to know that uh, I believe the Lord's going to do some great things. I see what God is doing. And I think he's doing some big stuff. And then he finished with, and I want you to know I love you. Never said that before. Oh, my goodness. And the Lord had just said, I'm going to heal this. How good is that? And it was during a time where here I am just spending time with Jesus. Just in that, I felt like the Holy of Holies. Just in his presence, just worshiping, having a blast. You know, confidence to enter in. That's what he's saying in Hebrews. Have a high confidence. Draw near. I know you guys are struggling. I know life's hard and all that stuff. But man, it's worth it to draw near. It's so worth it. Um, and it's funny. I, I should say this on that relationship. It doesn't mean that the relationships are always going to be easy and all that stuff. But your part, the Lord healed it. So you can do love. They may struggle. They may be great sometimes. You know, whatever they do in that, don't worry about it. But the Lord did something miraculous, especially on my end, and that affects the relationship. And that's so good. I love how God can do that. So that's, that's about it. Um, all that to say, man, draw near. You will never regret it. Draw near. So thank you, God. Pray? Okay. Yeah, so let's just pray then. Father, we just thank you uh, for this privilege to, uh, man, just to be here today. Uh, man, there's so many things in our lives that we could have been in a different place. But you, you have been so faithful and you've been so good. And I just pray, God, that if any of us, Lord, were, we've been far off, we've been unsure, or maybe we've been busy. And now we have a confidence and we see how good you are and it's like, man, I want to come close, but I'm not sure. I know you're good, but I'm still not sure. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give us that confidence. There would be an instilled confidence in the goodness of God, in the love of God. Amen. Yeah, and if anybody just wants to pray, I invite you to come up, whether you're the maturest one here or you're struggling. It, it's for all of us. It is for all of us. Amen. That we need God. We need to come in daily whether you're in any spot. So I just invite that now. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's our hope and prayer that the Holy Spirit truly ministered to you through this message from the Word of God. If you'd like to know more, look us up at livingstonfirstchurch.com or follow us on social media. And we look forward to seeing you in person soon.